Amen. Let's all stand once again. We'll sing Living Hope.
you're singing, maybe see. Amen. In just a moment, Melody's going to sing for us. And uh, I tell you, I enjoy watching you all sing. I, I watched a, a man that just got shaved recently. I thought he was going to blow a lung out while he, when he was singing Living Hope back there. Brother Bill Arwan, I mean, he leaned back and he was letting it go. And uh, I tell you, just a beautiful song. And I know our hearts have already been touched this morning uh, through the music. And as a pastor, it touches my heart just to look out and to know all the stories all that's transpired, what God has set people free from, how he saved them. And has God saved you? Say amen. amen. Is he your hope this morning? Say amen. Hey, amen. our hope is not in a political party or a political candidate. Our hope is in Jesus Christ. Amen. And uh, I am um, uh, excited to have the Summers family with us this week. And of course, uh, the uh, highlight is having uh, Melody to be able to sing for us. And uh, we've been uh, praying uh, for Melody uh, with her health challenges and her recent diagnosis. And uh, so she's going to sing. Uh, you think she ought to sing one song for us this morning? Do you think she ought to sing two? All right. Go ahead and sing two for us. And uh, you <laughs> Adam's looking at her like... <laughs> But um, uh, you listen to the words of the songs as Melody sings this morning.
to only get much worse. We cry to God in anguish, Lord, how long will you allow this evil world to just go on and on? But all of us who made this got our choice can listen in our spirit and we can hear. sand is on the shores. He sees every sparrow that falls. He made the mountains and the seas. He's in control of everything, of all creatures great and small. And he knows my Every step I take, every move that I make, every tear that I cry. He knows my name when I'm overwhelmed by the pain and can't see the light of day. I know I'll be just fine. He knows my tell you what's in store. I don't know a lot of things. I don't know all the answers to the questions of life, but I know Every move that I make, every tear that I cry, he knows my name when I'm overwhelmed by the pain and can't see the light of day. I know I'll be just fine. He knows my Amen. Are you uh, glad you came to church this morning already? Adam, I don't think we even need you to preach this morning. So, <laughs> No, we know the Lord's been working in, uh, in your heart and has a message for us this morning. We're looking forward to what that is. Of course, uh, Brother Summers is no uh, stranger here. If you wouldn't mind, maybe give us a little 
uh, update on uh, Melody's health and what's going on there. And um, uh, you come and preach to us this morning what the Lord's given to you. Thank you. Good morning. It's good to be back in Batavia. Batavia, another year. It's good to see so many uh, friends we've met over the years. I'm glad that you are here this morning. Thank you for the privilege to be here today. Thank you for praying for my family and for my wife specifically. Um, I was in, I was in uh, Greece and Turkey. Uh, actually, I was with, with your pastor uh, in January. And uh, Melody called me while I was there, and she said she was having some, some, some sensations in her hands and in her feet. And um, she, her, her father had an illness, and her uncle had the same illness. And um, in both of our minds, we were already thinking about the symptoms, and we both kind of had an idea of what was going on, but I don't think either one of us said anything. And um, I, I talked to her a couple of times, and, and uh, the, the numbness and weakness and tingling was persisting. And so uh, before I even got home, I'd already told her to go ahead and get a, a doctor's appointment. Let's try to figure out what's going on. And over the next few weeks and a couple of months, they were ruling out everything they could possibly rule out. They did some MRIs and all kinds of blood work and a bunch of, bunch, just a bunch of tests. And uh, then uh, we finally got a solid diagnosis that Melody has multiple sclerosis. And um, I forget exactly what, what month it was we figured that out, uh, but um, it's kind of what we'd already suspected anyway. And uh, many of you already know all that. Many of you have been praying. I actually got a text message from a, a few of you uh, saying that you were praying for my wife, and thank you for that. We really do appreciate it. Since the diagnosis, Melody has already had her first treatment, and um, every six months she goes for an infusion. And um, chances are there are either people in this place or you know you have families and friends uh, that have also been diagnosed with MS. And so some of you are familiar with it. There is no cure, uh, but uh, we, have a, uh, we serve a big God. Amen. We serve a big God who created these bodies. He knows what it takes to make them run, and uh, he knows how to fix and heal them. And so we're thankful for that. We're also thankful that we live in a country where we have medical um, care, and uh, it's really qu quite advanced from the time that Melody's father had the, this disease. And uh, so we're hoping that these infusions will slow the, slow the thing down and, and um, take care of some of those symptoms. I'm also grateful for insurance. Melody just told me on the way up that she got the first bill. And uh, for one treatment, for one infusion, was $60,000. $60,000. And I'm thankful she married a rich man that, that you just can afford that. And not really. Now, I'm a Baptist preacher. No Baptist preacher that I know is, is rich other than your pastor. But... Uh, <laughs> I'm thankful, I'm thankful for insurance because the Lord has, has taken care of the bulk of that and uh, we're grateful for that. Please continue to pray for Melody and uh, that the Lord would uh, continue to provide and, and give strength and, and all that's needed there. Uh, if you uh, are, are praying for us, pray specific. Uh, we are trying to sell our home and uh, find something a little bit more conducive, less stairs and all of that to make it a little bit easier for Melody in the future. And um, just a lot needs to happen to have all that happen. So if you want to pray specifically, just ask the Lord to, to help sell our house quickly and so that we can find something to move into. I'd like to be moved in before winter, uh, if, if at all possible. All right, let's find the book of Colossians chapter 2. The book of Colossians chapter 2. It is so good to be back with you. It's so good to be back with, with uh, Brother Taylor and uh, Miss Sarah. And um, uh, your pastor said a while ago, he mentioned how hard Miss Sarah works. And she, that is no joke. That, that woman, ever since I've known them, she has been a worker. And um, anything you can do to relieve that burden and do a little more for her and him, I'm sure would be appreciated. Although I am quite confused as to why we're not counting ham and bean soup as soup. No, I don't need an explanation. I just think it's, I think it's borderline heresy. I, I don't know how else to approach it. Um, I don't know. If someone wants to bring ham and potato soup, uh, or ham and pea, bean, whatever. It's got ham in it, bring it. That can't be bad. It can't be bad. I don't want to usurp your pastor's authority. I don't know what kind of bands he has around here on ham and bean soup, but whatever. There's a ham and bean soup. Okay, my, my mistake. My mistake. If you bring something with ham and beans that's not called soup, I'll still eat it, but whatever. <laughs> we can, and, uh, <laughs> so 
So, I was preaching last Sunday morning. Your pastor was in Sierra Leone. And uh, I assumed he was there doing godly stuff. I, I don't know, you know, <laughs> preaching. We're hearing about hundreds being saved and baptized and, you know, nearly 2,000 showing up for services. You think, oh, what a mighty move of God this must be. While I'm preaching last Sunday morning, I received the following text from your beloved pastor. <laughs> One sentence, very short, came from the heart, says, your hair looks non-existent online. <laughs> That's it. No explanation why he was watching my service instead of your service. I don't know what was going on. Wasn't a great revival in Sierra Leone, I can tell you that. <laughs> He says the hair was singular. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Got a bald brother who says he's got my back. <laughs> Colossians chapter. We got to get spiritual for a few minutes, all right? I don't know what just happened here. Colossians chapter 2. Let's, uh, you've been sitting for a minute. Why don't you stand with me? Let's read a verse together in Colossians chapter 2. I, I trust that this passage of scripture is probably not unfamiliar to anybody here. I, I know your preacher teaches the Bible. I know that this is probably a familiar passage to a Bible-believing church, but I think we might be able to get some help from just maybe some reminders this morning. Uh, let's read in Colossians chapter 2, and we'll just read one verse and then we'll pray. It says in verse 13, And you, being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh, hath he quickened together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses. Father, please bless your word this morning. God, I pray that you would be with Faith Baptist in Chelsea. God, would you please encourage them and take care of their needs today. God, help Brother Dowdy as he's preaching right now. And then, Lord, would you please bless the time we have here. We'll thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Pastor Taylor, what time do you all usually end? Whenever I'm done, all right. It is quarter till, and I just used like five minutes talking about my bald head. I'm sorry. <laughs> Colossians chapter 2. i, I got to say one more thing before we get into the, the text this morning. I want to wish my wife a happy anniversary. To, today, they just applauded you for getting to be married to me for 23 years. So, for 23 years. We've been married, and from the time we got married, we got busy in the church, and uh, most services, even before I was pastor, we were teaching and working around the church, and, and I, I thought about this the other day. In the last 23 years, most of the preaching my wife has heard has been mine, and uh, yet she's still willing to come with me to meetings like this, and I am so appreciative of that. I love you, and I hope you have a great anniversary. Colossians chapter 2 Verse 13 begins with uh, a description of us, what we were before Christ, and I, I don't want to spend much time on verse 13 because I really want to get to verse 14, but verse 13 does say, and you being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh. Can I just remind you that no matter how glamorous the world makes a life of sin seem, the reality is it's not a, a life at all, it's actually death. Uh, to live this life enjoying the pleasures of sin is a, is a wasted life. It is not worth the time. It is so brief, and the moment the person draws their final breath after enjoying an entire earthly life in sin, the moment that final breath is drawn, they will realize immediately what an utter waste it has been and what a fool they have been. It all seems good right now, and there are so many things in this life for us to take and enjoy in the flesh, but the moment we die and we step from this life into eternity, this life will be seen for what it really is, and that is vanity. It's brief. It, in the, it, it doesn't last. This is why the Bible says that she that liveth in pleasure is dead while she liveth. And so verse 13 begins by describing our life before Christ, our life indulging in and living in sin. It says that we were dead in those sins. We were dead in that existence. 
It's hard to understand. Obviously, we're talking about the spirituality of a man, the spirit of a man, the soul of man is what matters. It says, spiritually speaking, we were dead. It goes on a little bit later and it says, us that were dead, hath he quickened together with him having forgiven you all your trespasses. What an interesting phrase that is. He's quickened us, and then he's forgiven us of all our trespasses. Now, now listen, I am very thankful for the forgiveness that God has extended to us. I don't want to diminish that. I don't want to devalue that this morning because the forgiveness of our sins is an enormous thing. It's an enormous gift. It's an enormous blessing. But let's not forget that we serve a most holy and righteous God. He is a God that, yes, is plenteous and mercy and grace, and he's ready to pardon and forgive. But because he's holy and he's righteous, he cannot simply do away with our sin as though it never happened. He cannot, in his, in his justness, he cannot simply ignore the fact that we are sinners. And so let's not read verse 13, assuming that it means in spite of what I've done, God one day just decided to pretend like it never happened, and let's just hit the reset button and start from scratch. That's not the way forgiveness works. There's something that had to be done. And then we come to verse 14. And verse 14 is where we, we get a glimpse into the process necessary for us to receive that forgiveness mentioned in verse 13. Verse 14 says this, Blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to its cross, and having spoiled principalities and powers, he made a show of them openly, triumphing over them in it. And what, a, what an amazing way to explain our salvation. To simply say, I'm saved. Okay, so yes, I'm saved, that is true. But if that's all we ever know about our salvation, we have missed the beauty of it. Uh, we, I, I remember reading a, a sermon by Charles Spurgeon one time. It was about the woman who came to Jesus and his disciples asking for help uh, for her daughter. And if you recall, the story goes that she came to uh, the disciples and they uh, trying to get to Jesus. And, and they said, well, Master doesn't have time for you right now. Go away. But she persisted. And finally they came to Jesus and said, Lord, what will you just send this woman away? She's troubling us. And Jesus says to the woman, what do you want from me? And she says, uh, I, I, my, my, my daughter is sick. Here's what Jesus said. Jesus said, it's not meat. It's not good to take the meat from the children and give it to dogs. Here's what he was saying to her. You are not worth my time. You do not deserve for me to help you. What a cruel thing for Jesus, the Son of God, to say to someone in need. But he had a plan and a purpose in this. And she responded and said, yea, Lord, but even the dogs wait for the crumbs at the master's table. Jesus says, I've not seen so great faith as this woman. Here's what Charles Spurgeon said about this woman. He said it's as though her faith was a diamond in a ring, and it's as though Jesus was, every time he told her no, every time she met rejection, it's as though Jesus was holding up that ring to the light and turning it a little bit so it gained more light and sparkled brighter and brighter. She was persistent. This this. Listen, to simply say she had faith, didn't do it. Jesus wanted to show just how great the faith was. I think we do that with salvation sometimes. So I want to thank the Lord I'm saved. Well, I, I'm thankful I'm saved too. But the beauty of salvation is seen when we consider what it took for us to be saved. Verse 14 begins to peel back the layers of this thing, and we get to see a little bit of it. It begins by saying, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances. It's the only place this phrase occurs like this in your Bible. It's a very unique phrase, and you really need to stop and think about the context of the passage in order to understand the significance of it. Blotting out the handwriting of ordinances. What is so significant? Why would he say it that way? Let's think back in our minds 2,000 years. 2,000 years ago, there were no public schools. 2,000 years ago, the literacy rate was, was very, very low. There, there weren't very many people who could read or write. 
most jobs didn't require you to be able to read and write. We're talking about people that were farmers and carpenters and, and simple tradesmen. If you were able to read and write, you were educated, you were privileged, you were some of the higher class folks of society. And so when it says blotting out the handwriting of ordinances, we need to think and ask the question, what is so significant about handwriting ordinances? Typically handwriting, if you are familiar with, with Jewish and Jewish Roman customs of that day, you find that, that uh, the writings and handwritings were a very special thing that only educated people uh, knew how to do. But more than that, writing materials were not readily available. They were not cheap. It cost something. Usually, uh, other, other than academia, any other, any other writings were, were typically used in the government. They were legal documents. And if you do your research, you find that these legal documents were very, very important. And it's specifically when it came to deeds and receipts, those kinds of things were, were written down and certified by uh, a government official. And so as we talk in verse 14 about blotting out the handwriting of ordinances, these ordinances that are being mentioned, it's, it's referring to laws. These legal declarations, and these legal declarations did a couple of things. Number one, it recorded our, our condemnation, it recorded the guilt uh, that was declared upon us in, in the handwriting of the ordinances. So the Apostle Paul is writing to the Colossians, and he is, he's reminding them how precious and rich their salvation is, and how he, he describes the forgiveness they received as, first of all, uh, blotting out of the handwriting of ordinances. And so let's stop for a moment and consider what that means in our lives. As Christians, what in the world, what legal document, what ordinances were, were on us? What legal ordinances and, and the writings were we under? Uh, for time's sake, we can't go reading the whole passage, but in the book of Romans chapter 7, the Apostle Paul says, I was alive once, but the law came. And when the law came, I died. What he's saying is, I thought I was okay until the law of God entered and showed me just how wretched and wrong I really was. And on that day, that handwriting, that ordinance, showed me how guilty I was and it was hanging over my head. It says, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us. This word contrary is a very interesting word to me. This word contrary, it doesn't simply mean uh, um, opposed to. If, if you study this word out, uh, you, you find that it means more than just being opposed to. Contrary in the, in the Bible in this passage refers to barriers between. Barriers between. So the blotting out of, of the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, this law that says you're guilty, you're guilty, you're guilty. No matter how I tried to find a way around it, it was always contrary to me. It was always a boundary. It was always an obstacle between me and God. And we look around us in the world, and religion today, it's, it's so obvious, it's easy to see this in those religions. Uh, people say things like, just, uh, just go to church. I'm glad you're in church. I think you ought to be in church. This is a good place to be on a Sunday morning. This doesn't do anything to remove the handwriting and ordinances that are against you. It doesn't do anything. There are people who will say, just send us the money. Uh, say, well, uh, God will bless you and increase it. And that won't do anything to blot out the handwriting of ordinances that is against you. It won't do anything for you. Being a good husband, I think you ought to be a good husband. They got to love your wife. You got to take care of your wife and children. That won't do anything to remove the handwriting of ordinances that was against us. So we read that in verse 13, we have forgiveness of our sins. Well, how? Verse 14 says, well, it's because somehow something happened to these ordinances, this law that was against us. I, I, I remember my parents teaching me about Jesus and teaching me about sin and heaven and hell and explaining that I needed to be saved. And I remember even in my little boy mind, seven years old, I remember trying to reason through all of this and try to prove 
prove certain things. I remember deciding that I was going to stop sinning. I was going to be good. As a seven-year-old boy. That lasted about 30 seconds. <laughs> There's a lot of adults who have not come to the realization that it's futile. It's a waste. They get up in the morning and say, today's the day I do right. Today's the day I'm going to be a good I'm going to do more good than I do wrong today. In just a little while, you hit a barrier of that law. It's contrary to it. And you say, no, I'm, I'm coming to God. I'm going to be good. I'm going to get to God by being good today. And it says, oh, but you've already done this and this and this. Okay, well, tomorrow I'm going to try a different way. I'm, I'm going to be good in a different way. I'm going to avoid those things I did wrong yesterday. And then, boom, there's a barrier. The law says, good try. You're still a sinner. And everywhere I go, there's another, another barrier. There's a law saying, good try, Adam, maybe tomorrow. And man has done this uh, since, since the fall in the garden. Man has made efforts to be good, but at every turn, uh, God's law says, you're a failure, you're a failure, you're a failure. Thank God it doesn't end there. Amen. He says that something's happened to these ordinances that were against us, that were contrary to us. Look what the next part of the verse says. He says he blotted it out. He took it out of the way. I, I, I like history. I, I, um, I, I, like, uh, I like reading about cultures, and, and I, I just enjoy that kind of thing. And I was studying one time when I came through this passage of Scripture. Uh, I, I was thinking about the blotting out and what all this meant. And, and um, as you look at history, you look at the, the writing surfaces and the way people wrote things down. Um, they didn't, if, I mean, if I mess up on a piece of paper, I just wad it up, throw it in the trash can, go on to the next piece of paper. They didn't do that 2,000 years ago. It was a big deal. They took their time. And when something was wrong, they did this thing called blotting. And the, the, the paper they used was, was very thick. It was papyrus. It was reeds compressed and, and, and kind of made into a pulp and made into a, a, a flat sheet, very, very rigid, not soft at all. And, and so the most common source of, of writing surface was that papyrus paper, and they would, uh, they, they would write on it. When there was a mistake or when they no longer needed the document, they didn't just wad it up and throw it away because it, it could still be used. They developed this, this system called blotting. And you would take a, a sponge or a cloth of some sort and you would dip it in water and then you would, you would blot on, on that writing surface, blot on that paper. Not soaking it, just getting that, the very top of it wet. How many of you have ever tried to uh, clean up a mess with toilet paper? On the floor, your kids spill a drink and you're like, I don't, where's the paper towels? Just get me the toilet paper. All right. You make like one wipe across the floor and it starts to shred and little pieces of it roll up. You, you, know, you know what I'm talking about? Okay, imagine that kind of material. They would blot, they would blot the paper, the whole surface that needed to be taken away, and they would very gently take their hand, begin to go across the top of it. And a little bit by little bit, that top layer would, would roll off. They would roll, and then not getting it too wet because you don't want to go too deep. They'd keep doing it until every mark was gone. That's interesting to me. The phrase here, blotting out, the word that we get that from is the same word that's used two times in Revelation that's translated wiping away every tear. That's what God's going to do to us one day. He's going to wipe every tear off of our eyes, but in this passage it says it's the same concept. Getting rid of doing away with, eliminating complete, not covering over, blotting out, removing completely. That's what he did with the handwriting of ordinances that was against me. And then, if we needed a better picture, look at what the last part of the verse says. It says he took it out of the way. Well, that's great. Where did he take it? I mean, that's a, that's a lot to take out of the way. I, by myself, if Jesus just had to pay for Adam Summer's sin, all by myself, forget you. Let's assume for a minute that everybody else was sinless except Adam Summers. 
for Jesus Christ to take my sin, take, take my condemnation, that's enormous. But he did it for every one of us. He took it out of the way. That's what it says. That, that boundary. Remember, trying to do good, but there's a roadblock. I can't get to God this way. I can't get to God that way. I can't get to God over there. There's always a law telling me how bad I am. The Bible says he took those boundaries and just removed them, took them out of the way. But what did he do with it? Says he, it was nailing it to his cross. Nailing it to his cross. Custom says that when a debt was paid in full, they would take the, a copy of the ordinance and they would post it publicly as a witness to anyone that saw it. If, if me and, and uh, Pastor Taylor had, uh, had a disagreement and uh, we went to court and they found in, in your pastor's favor and I had to pay restitution of some sort, uh, there would be a writing, uh, an ordinance that was against me that says I have to pay this much money every, every week, every month until it's all paid for. And the, the, the moment it's all paid for, they will take their copy of that signed and certified handwriting that was against me and, and they would post it on a public board, public post. They would leave it there for everyone to see that no matter what he says, he can never come back to me and say, you still owe me more. It was nailed to that post for everyone to see. It was paid in full. The Bible says that Jesus Christ, though there were handwritings and ordinances against us, we were guilty. We owed a debt. Jesus Christ came by one day and said, I'd like to take that. And he went with his own blood and paid in full for Adam Summers. And then he took that handwriting. The Bible says he nailed it to the cross. No one will ever be able to come to, the, to God the Father and say, Adam Summers still owes a debt that he's got to pay or he'll never make it because God will say, no, no, no. It's been posted. It's, it's been blotted out. It's been taken out of the way. It's paid in full. I love the old hymns. I, it's my favorite kind of music, the old hymns. My, one of my top favorite hymns is the song, It Is Well With My Soul. Amen. A third verse of It Is Well With My Soul says this. My sin, oh the bliss of this glorious thought. My sin, not in part, but the whole, is nailed to the cross and I bear it no more. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, oh my soul. I am no longer under the handwriting of ordinances that was against me. He blotted it out, wiped it away. It's gone. And then he nailed it to the cross for all the world to see. And I believe that's why Romans chapter 8 verse 1 says, There is now therefore no condemnation to them. That's me. To them. You're looking at me like I'm crazy. Find Romans chapter 8. We'll finish with this. Romans chapter 8. Chapter 7 ends with the Apostle Paul talking about this law that's within him and the things he knows he ought to be doing he ends up not doing and those things he doesn't want to do he ends up doing and he says it's a never-ending cycle oh wretched man that I am who shall save me from this vile that's that's what he says in uh, chapters 6 and 7 then he gets to chapter 8 and he talks about what's happened to him since he's been saved after all of that he says in verse 1 there is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walked not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. Before I was in Christ Jesus, I had the law against me. The law was a representation of the divine character of God. God is perfect in every way, and to help us understand just how we measure up to him, he gave us the law. Paul calls the law his schoolmaster. It taught him who he really was. One day, Adam Summers bowed his head and said, Lord, I'm a sinner. The best I can ever do will never be good enough. Please save me. And that writing that was against me 
God said, let, let me have that. I got some blotting out to do, but he didn't reach for the water cup. He started blotting with something that was much more precious than water. It was the shed blood of my Savior. Began to blot that out. And in doing so, took it out of the way. It's gone. Nailed it to his cross and said, he's free and clear of this debt. It's been paid in full. All right, here it is in closing. I don't know you very well at all. I know some of you better than others. Some of you, I don't recognize your faces. Maybe you're new to the church in the last year or two. I don't know. But if you're here today and you've not given up on trying to be good enough, if someone asks you right now, how do you know you're saved from your sin, and you say, well, I go to church, or I've been in church my whole life, or my parents were, or were faithful to church, dad was a deacon, he was a pastor, or I give money to the church, or whatever, I work the bus, I teach a class. If that's what you point to as evidence that you're saved, then I ask you right now, what are you doing with that handwriting and ordinances that are against you? I didn't ask you what you're doing good. I asked you, what are you doing with all the bad that you've done? It doesn't just vanish and go away. It might be that you're sitting in a church house on a Sunday morning, and yet you're lost. Sitting here in a church house on a Sunday morning is not evidence of salvation. Remember those people that came to Jesus... He was talking about, he's talking about how it was going to be in the last days, and he says there's going to be people that come to me, and they're going to say, Lord, we did all these wonderful works in your name. We, we, we fed the hungry. We cast out devils. We did, did all of these miracles in your name. And Jesus said, I'm going to look at them on that day and say, I never knew you. Depart from me. How tragic it would be somebody sitting here this morning or listening at home is clinging to what they've done for God as the hope of their eternity instead of clinging to what he's done for them. I hope you're a good person. That'll never save you. The blood of Jesus Christ is the only thing that can blot out your sins. The only, the only place that's handwriting uh, and ordinances that were against you, the only place they'll ever be nailed and said to be paid in full is on the cross of Jesus Christ. It's the only hope you've got. So I wonder, how are things with you this morning? If this is your last Sunday morning service, where will you spend eternity? You think God's going to be impressed with all you've done for him? On that day, he'll look at you and say, well, I gave you my son. I I gave my beloved son. He paid for your sins, and you think, I should be impressed because you gave a few dollars to the church? I I watched my son pray and ask me to find another way, and yet I went through with nailing him to the cross, and You think I'll be impressed because you were faithful to your husband or to your wife? On that day, the only thing that'll matter is what you've done with Jesus Christ. That's it. Would you bow your heads, please?